Hello everyone and welcome to the Hidden Lives of Writers. My name's Fiona Snickers and my co-host is Gail Schimmel. Hello Fiona. How has your writing week been? I've been looking forward to speaking to you this week. I'm, I'm dying to hear how your writing's going. I feel like I'm getting back into my stride because as we record this, we are fairly newly back from the Christmas break. And for me, it I kept my writing routine going as long as possible. And then when the family really descended and the festivities got underway, it became impossible. And I tried to consciously take a break and think, mm. okay, I'll get mm. back to it. But it's a difficult time for me. It's difficult on many levels, not least of which is what it does to my professional life. Uh, I've heard you say that you do very well with holidays, with keeping the writing going on holiday. So I think because on some level, even though I see myself as a professional writer, working writer, on some level writing is still my hobby and not my day job mm -hmm. that when I'm on holiday from my day job I have more time and more energy to write right. and on the whole I do write very well on the holidays but I realized this holiday that my method of writing a lot during holidays means I never get a complete holiday mm. and I maybe need to relook at that I did over the Christmas part just stop writing altogether I put that laptop away and I stopped writing and I gave myself a complete break from everything because I think I really needed it and then came back to an edit that I hadn't finished as I should have because I had put it away and not worked on it and that I have found very, very difficult. I love being edited. Um, it's normally my favorite part of the process, but this edit has been really difficult and I handed it in unsure on whether I've done the job, which is not a great feeling. So I've had a bit of a icky writing week. Now, this is the book that's coming out this year. Coming out in May. It is called The Finish Line, I think, mm -hmm. so far. I think that's the final decision. And it's a book that I wrote at the beginning. I wrote like I was in some sort of fever dream. I was so obsessed with it. Mm -hmm. And I love it. Just the edit, I, I can't explain. Um, it was like wading through syrup. Interesting, interesting. So the writing process was fast and the fast editing process and, uh, has been slow and difficult. Yeah. And Gail, what have you been reading or listening to or watching lately? So, last time we spoke, you talked about this idea of reading a certain amount every day, almost having a goal that you must read, I think, 20 or 25% of the book you That's said right. yes, you want yes. to read. And I was a bit unsure about this idea. I'm always very worried about something that makes reading into a job. But after you said it, I realized that it does another thing. It allows... Reading it allows reading, which should, which is a pleasure for me. Um, mm -hmm. you know, reading for me sounds like I'm, feels like I'm indulging myself. Mm -hmm. But if you make it into a job, then you don't have to feel guilty about doing it. Like <laughs> I have to finish twenty percent of this book today, and that's on my to-do list. And so I'm going to sit on the couch and read because now I'm being very good. <laughs> and on that thinking, for the first time this year, I'm doing Goodreads, mm -hmm. and I haven't done it before because I know how goal-driven I am, and I know what having a target does to my head. And indeed, that is happening. I am obsessed with my figures. I'm obsessed with how much I've read. I've whether I'm meeting my target, how many books ahead am I? Da -da -da. Da, da. But also it's allowed me to treat reading as this is one of the jobs I'm doing. And that's quite nice. I don't feel so guilty about sitting around reading. And one of the books I've been sitting around reading that I've given five stars on Goodreads is a book called Wayward by Emily Hart. Mm -hmm. I seem to be reading one thriller, one one fantasy at the moment um, with a little bit of literary thrown in. And Wayward is a very witchy book. And I was scared of it because I don't like... Um, witch hunt books I find them very disturbing and I don't like books about domestic abuse and I knew that that was a feature of this book but despite both these things that I don't like it's about the power of women mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. I love books about the power of women so Wayward by Emily Hart is loved it thoroughly recommend it what about you well I watched on a very strong recommendation the movie Tar with okay. Kate Blanchett um, it's very much a filmmaker's film. 
filmmakers love it, they admire it, they think it's wonderful, and it went down less well with the actual watching public. I think it won awards, it it was nominated for everything, but it didn't do very well in the popularity stakes. And I think that's because it has a very unlikable main female character, oh. which is something I'm tinkering with myself. And I, I did use it in Lacuna, not such an unlikable, but but she had unlikable qualities to her or qualities where you got irritated. And it was interesting seeing uh, these filmmakers really leaning into that. Um, and it, it was also one of these gender reversal type stories okay. where you know normally it's the men who have a lot of power and are greatly lauded who then abuse that power um especially with their underlings and here we have a highly successful uh, woman who's a, a conductor of the Berlin Philharmonic she's at the absolute apex peak of her career and she too is abusing that power and abusing her underlings and one wonders you know what what is the message that women are no better than men um that if you give women power and leadership roles they'll be just as bad as men i'm not totally convinced about that <laughs> message i sort of have the sneaking suspicion that we do a better job but maybe i'm wrong but you know also it it doesn't have to be the story of all stories it mm. is a story mm. of a woman who does abuse mm. her position mm. and she is you can't root for her because she is so terrible in various ways but the performance is absolutely brilliant and it was interesting to see how the filmmakers really made you sit in that discomfort and let you not look away from it i'm not clear if you're recommending it or not but i can tell you i don't want to sit in any discomfort <laughs> i'm recommending it to anybody who's interested in this theme and who is interested in filmmaking tackling a really difficult topic that's as far as I'll go in my recommendation <laughs> <laughs> I had to keep interrupting the movie and sort of playing a bit of Candy Crush just to sort of get my equilibrium back <laughs> I hadn't taken you as a Candy Crush Fiona <laughs> <laughs> and I'm pretty sure our guest today is not a Candy Crusher I don't think so but he is someone who is comfortable sitting in discomfort that's for sure Our guest today is Sven Axelrad. Sven's debut novel, Buried Treasure, has landed with a bang on a the bang. South African literary scene. Um up up till now we haven't really interviewed debut no novelists, but in this case, you know, we know that Sven has written extensively before this book came out. He has another book coming out a bit later this year. and that book berry treasure was so impactful and so dense there's so much to talk about in it that uh, we've really been looking forward to this mm. conversation so sven welcome thank you for your time and um can you tell us how your writing week has been going first of all thank you for that lovely introduction that's really kind um my writing week has been uh, non-existent this week I also have a corporate day job as an accountant and in uh January it's budget time so I've literally just been plugging away at budgets um this whole week so nothing too exciting to report back but I've just finished at the big be beginning of Jan I just finished the edit for God's pocket um and it is it's been actually lovely to take a break to be honest uh I just told myself just do your normal job this week and by the end of January I'll kick off again and do something I'll get started again And when you say you'll get started again, will that be the third of the Vivo books? No, I've actually written the third Vivo book already. So the choice would be to go in and and clean up the first draft, um, or start something entirely new, which is quite an exciting idea. Uh, you know, you said I've been re I've written quite a bit before this. Uh, some of the early ones I wrote was when I didn't actually have the skill <laughs> to write those books, and so I, I used the ideas, but they didn't quite come out right. and i feel like i've been going back and sort of correcting my past mistakes and rewriting old books into things that formats and styles that i that i think are are worthy now you know um but i'm i'm at the end of those books so when i start in february i'll truly be starting something new that's quite exciting as a a writer i think there is something lovely about going into a new world and a new story yeah i never exactly know what it's going to be though so in you mentioned your day job please can you 
explain to us how a person who obviously, I mean, you, you're quite a literary writer. You, you, we've talked about the fact that we already know about you, that you write a lot. Tell us how you came to write and how you became to be an accountant at the same time. Like, what's the origin story? What's the superhero origin story of Sven the writer? <laughs> Um, some, for most of my life, it felt more like a, perhaps like a tragedy rather than a superhero origin. But, um, it's a funny one though. I, you know, when I, when I finished school, I thought I was going to be a musician. I, you know, I was, I've always been a singer songwriter and, um, and I was convinced that that was sort of my creative path. And I did say to myself, like, oh, one day I want to write a book. I enjoy, even with music, the lyrics was what I enjoyed more than anything else. Um, but when I finished school, being a South African kid, I was concerned about getting a job. I looked around at my friends that were in the arts and I was like, I'm not sure if, you know, I grew up, uh, without much and I didn't want to end up, you know, where I started. So I, I just picked a solid career. Honestly, I, I didn't know what I was going to do. I picked accounting. Well, I didn't even pick accounting. I picked BCom and, uh, just as a stable thing. And I thought, you know what? I'll do what I need to do after hours. And I did. I was in a couple of bands and we played, you know, Splashy Fin and Woodstock and things. Um, and it just sort of all sort of took off without me. I, I went down a road I didn't mean to go down. Um, I remember clearly sitting in my first lecture for, I think it was accounts two. It's the second year. I remember looking around the room and thinking, wow, like I'm not the same as anyone in this room. You know, they all had their Deloitte or, you know, KPNG pencil bags and they knew where they were going to go. And, and I didn't even know what the big five firms were. Um, I had long hair and, you know, second hand clothes and I, I just knew I didn't really fit there. I wanted to do something creative, but there was the side of my personality that actually is very well suited to the accounting and that. And, um, the two just never seemed to get along with each other. If I was at work, you know, for a while I studied and worked um, doing my auditing articles and stuff and studying at night. And I knew that whole day I wouldn't do anything I wanted to do. And I, so I would get home late, sort of nine o'clock at night after a full day of work and studying. I remember I'd, I'd go for a run once around the block um, and then I would write. And that's how I actually wrote my first book. I, I would write for half an hour. Um, and then I would collapse and do it again the next day. Um, and that book, that's when I realized that I really wanted to write because that book was the only thing keeping me afloat. Um, I think I would have, if you met me then, I would, I, you would, it's remarkably different if you met me now. I was, I wasn't a particularly happy person. And, um, that book kept me afloat, kept, kept me going. And I didn't actually realize that when I finished that book, I didn't show it to anyone. I didn't. I didn't tell people I was doing it. I, don't, I just did it and it kept me alive. And then I put it on the shelf and I, and I probably only picked it up again eight years later and started taking writing seriously. But when I look back, I realized that that's the thing that kept me going. You know? And did you immediately start writing another book after that? Or was there a break um, that that book had served its purpose and you focused on your day job? Yeah, it, it was a massive break after that. So that, that would have been when I was um, probably... 21 around there um years old and then i wrote that and i probably didn't write again until i was not seriously until i was 30 um so a massive break between that i just i care i went back to music and i you know as a creative outlet and, and just carried on working until fairly recently it probably about six years ago um my wife and I were chatting and I, she, you know, she was very tired of me complaining about, um, going to work and I'd be like, Oh, it's so boring at work. And she, she just eventually she was like, listen, just stop, like stop doing the accounting thing. We'll figure it out. Right. Give it a go. You know? And that's when I realized that I didn't actually have to stop doing accounting. I like having the solid job and a steady income. Um, I just needed to get extremely disciplined and organized. Um, and I did that. I started waking up really early every morning. Um, and I started writing before I went to work. So by the time I got to work, I used to feel like I was already, um, seeing things differently than everyone else. You know, I was listening to sometimes when I'm at work and I'm bored, uh, don't tell my, my, my employers this, but sometimes I just listen to the way that people speak, you know, like the, 
how, you know, I've got a weird cadence to my voice. I always pause and I, and I notice how other people speak. And I think what more that look like on the page. And, you know, I wonder what their backstory is. And, and I start to th see the world in a, a more colorful way. Um, and it really turned a corner for me when that happened is when I wrote the two books that are, that will definitely make it out into the world. One of them was buried treasure. And I, I remember reading that out. My wife is my first, uh, listener. I read it to her out loud. And I remember she was in the kitchen and I was sitting on a chair outside. I'm not allowed in the kitchen. And, uh, <laughs> I, I just get in the way apparently, but I remember reading it out loud to her and she loved it. She was delighted by it. Um, she thought it was funny. She thought it was, you know, she was really into it. And that's when I kind of knew that I was onto something. I think my new renewed sort of passion and, and joy actually came through. Um, but it's mixed in, you know, with Barry Treasure, it's mixed in with a lot of, uh, the old me too, which is, it's a cynical, it's a cynical view trying to turn to positive, um, seeing the contradiction in everything, the contradiction of the day job and, and happiness versus sadness and purpose. And, and at that point I'd been rejected so many times also, um, by publishers and agents, you know, how the, how the industry works. And Barry Treasure was sort of a response to that saying, I don't, I'm not going to do what other people want me to do. I'm going to do exactly what I want to do. And that's the book that came from it. You know? Yeah, I wanted to ask about that, whether those five manuscripts, I think in other interviews you've mentioned that you had five manuscripts ready written before Buried mm. Treasure came out. And um, whether you actually did submit those um, to publishers whether you received rejections and then how you managed to keep going because a lot of people in their writing careers at that point, they get a rejection and they think, okay, I'm not cut out for this and they don't pursue it. So what kept you going? Was it just self-belief? It's funny. I'm, I'm not an overly confident person. You know, I don't think self-belief was it. Actually, maybe it was. Like I believed I had something unique and different to say. I didn't know if I was ever going to make it. I didn't submit all those five manuscripts. I submitted that first one. I never showed anyone and I still haven't. Um, the next one I did submit a lot. And that one, um, actually a lot of interaction from Penguin, South Africa, they, it, it made it, you know, passed all the hurdles, but failed. What did they want me to do? They wanted me to rewrite it, but in the first person, I, I had skipped voices. I had changed viewpoints the whole way through and they said, and, and I probably was, didn't have the skill to do it at that time. And they told me it would be better if it was all in the first person. And I, I did. I spent a year doing that, rewriting it. When I resubmitted it, they really liked it, but they, it failed on the budget hurdle, I think it was, um, which is even more disappointing, right? Because now they're saying, mm -hmm. hey, this book's worthwhile, but they don't think they can sell it. Um, mm. And at that point, I really did want to quit. I mean, you spend a year rewriting something and you're resubmitting it. Um but, and I did, I probably did quit actually. I can't remember properly, but I, I always quit. I'll say to my wife, Oh, that's it. You know, I'm just going to read now. I'm just going to be the guy that reads a lot. Um, and, and then she was, she always, she, she's like, shame. She's long suffering. She's like, yeah, sure things, Finn, you know, just quit. It's fine. Cause she knows I'm not going to quit. She knows I never give up. And I, you know, two weeks later, I'll, she wakes up and I'm sitting at my computer typing away again. Um, the choice really was, I find with me is that if I write and get rejected, I get depressed, right? Or well, we all do. Yeah. If I write, if I stop writing, then I'm just depressed. It, it doesn't, you know, I need writing. Like I said, with that first book that kept me afloat, I need to write just to stay afloat. Um, so really, if you've got those two choices, <laughs> why not write? You know, um, if you're going to be depressed anyway, let's be depressed with a book, you know? That's interesting. When you said the word afloat, I could hear a little bit of New Zealand in your accent. Just for a second, <laughs> I recognized it. And you told us um, when we were chatting before this interview that you uh, were born in New Zealand, lived part of your life there. Where does the New Zealand angle come in? Um, it's, a, it's a strange story how we got there, but um, basically my mom is a Durban, Durban girl. Um, and she was on holiday, matric holiday in PE with her whole family on the beach. Um, my mom's, there's actually, 
just a little teaser here. Um, I've got Penguin to put a, a photograph of my mom when she was 20 on the cover of my next novel that's coming out. So I'm really excited about that. Um, beautiful, beautiful young woman. And she's on the beach, uh, 20 years old with her family. And these Frenchmen come up and try to hit on her and her sister on the beach. Um, and one of them is my dad. He was sailing from France, um, where he'd been all over the place, but he was dropping, I think it was a yacht and they were sailing it past South Africa and then they would change up and eventually get to New Zealand. Um, and when he met my mom, he stayed, he, he just left the yacht, um, drove home drove with the family. I don't know how my grand let that happen. Drove home with the whole family <laughs> to back to Durban, um, stayed with them for a few days, then got a job in Cape Town and, you know, ended up taking my mom to her matric dance, uh, that kind of thing. And a couple of years later, very young, they got married. Um, and my dad was always going to New Zealand. So the two of them head off to New Zealand and my brother and I were born over there in Wellington. And now there's a piece missing in that puzzle because Sven Axelrod is not a French name. So, no. so there's some other, other origin story behind yeah. that. And it's, uh, it's apparently it's quite a mysterious one. I, I don't know. My family tree gets cut off on my dad's side, um, somewhere along the line. It is, I think it goes back two generations there in England. Um, but they're immigrants. And I think it's during, I don't know, it might be the first world war, second world war. Um, they must have immigrated, I think possibly from Poland. Um, I don't know how that gets a Nord Nordic name. Um, <laughs> My my brother and I always just say we're, we're pavement specials. You know, we've got the Nordic name, um, born in New Zealand, live in South Africa, uh, mishmash of accents, bit of everything. This this issue of place is an interesting one when you read Buried Treasure because Fiona and I were discussing where we think the book is set um, before before we started speaking to you. And I was so influenced by your name that I put it into a Scandinavian country. I decided, and then Fiona pointed okay. out to me that that's ridiculous. None of the names work for a Scandinavian <laughs> country. So I, I yeah. get that Vivo is a, is a fictional place and not maybe tied to anywhere particular, but where do you see Vivo? I love that you saw it somewhere different than I saw it. Um, I am a massive fan of South American literature. Um, you know, obviously using Bolaño and, uh, you know, before you get excited, I'm, uh, there's a caveat. Uh, you know, Bolaño, actually even Louis de Mineris' trilogy books are such a big influence to me, but, um, so I, I really wanted to, to do a bit of a, a tribute to, to those writers by setting it using, you know, Spanish, Portuguese, South American names, um, mostly. But I can't help but infuse a lot of Durban, uh, into, into Vivo. In, in my mind, it's, it's got a lot of Durban's feel, but not the cultural problems that, and complexities that we have here. Um, I, so I kind of, I think in my head, I blended it a lot with Lisbon as well. Um, Lisbon, not really Madrid. It's too fancy. Yeah. A lot of Lisbon. And I, I was think I was reading a Angolan writer at the time that had a connection with Lisbon. And I, when I went there, I felt something special in Lisbon. I felt a, a griminess amongst the beauty and history, uh, which is, which is the contradictions I think you find in Vivo a lot of. And, uh, I feel like anywhere there's a contradiction, that's probably a great fertile ground for, for, for setting or for art in general. And then Fiona did feel that the municipality came straight from South Africa. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, there's, uh, there's no <laughs> doubt that the municipality comes from South Africa. Yeah. Any, anyone who's tried to renew a passport here or, you know, get anything done knows the feeling. Yeah. Uh, I, did you feel, did you find Vivo a dark place or, you know, did you, I'm curious about this from your guys' side. I'm not sure. I, f I think I found it a light place because I find your writing very funny. Your your sense of humor for me meets my sense of humor. That that those little throwaway lines that have a quirky little joke in them that if you're reading too fast you miss. So I found the book very funny, um, and as a result, I found Viva a light-hearted place. Fiona. Okay. No, there's there's a darkness there in me a dark that Vivo touches 
And I okay. see it as a place without color. I see it as a kind of uh, crepuscular world. It's it's black and white. It's shades of gray. It's it's despair. It's darkness. There are little flashes of light and humor, but um, yeah. It's the it's the people copulating in the phone booth. It's I found them hilarious. It's stepping in excrement <laughs> just as you orgasm. It's uh it's it's dead people. It's it's what the um grave robber does to desecrate the corpse. It I found it very very dark. It was the darkness yeah. that resonated for me. Who's right? So I love that. <laughs> yes, so, so funny enough both of you are right. Um Fiona, I mean yeah, Gail, so you and I probably um, think similarly when it comes to this stuff, it sounds like. So when I was writing it, I was, again, I, I don't plan things when I start. I just I just go. And I felt that it was funny and uh, I didn't find it overly dark for, personally. Um, but the more the book has been out and I've got more of this kind of feedback, uh, the more I hear your stuff, you know, and I hear that people are saying that it's a very dark place. And even my closer friends were like, I oh, know it's, it's quite dark, but personally, that's how I see the world. I see it. I see it at the, like all the contradictions. I see it at the same time that yes, it is dark, but at the same time, humor exists everywhere. And what I was really trying to make here is. When, you know, I was looking at identity a lot and, and who we are without our names and all that kind of stuff. But what I realized once I was finished making it was what I was really looking for is, is a common sense of kindness, um, which I really hope came through in the book where all my characters are struggling. But if you watch them under pressure, most of them choose as best they can to, to be kind to the person next to them. Um, eventually or somehow, um, even when reluctantly sometimes and, I think that I needed the world to be uh, dark and gray so that kindness would show up in contrast against it. Um, but again, I figured that out later. I think at the time I was more on, on your side, girl, than just having a lot of fun. <laughs> you know. Can you tell us about the dog whose name is God? Um, I- I want to interrupt there because I disagree with you about this, Sven. I do not think that the dog's name mm-hmm. is God. I think the dog's name is Dog because I think your real name is the name that the people who love you call you, not the spelling of your name. <laughs> and you're going to have to, for the listener, you have to read the book to understand this argument. Um, maybe, Sven, you can briefly set out for the listener who hasn't read your book why we're we having an argument and then tell us about the name. Uh, first of all, first of all, I love the fact that we're having that argument. Small details are so important. So the reason we're having this argument is because early on in the novel, you'll meet an old man who lives in a cemetery and he's dyslexic and he's, his dog is, his name is dog, but he's gone to get the, the name tag, um, printed and he's dyslexic. So he's written God on the tag, um, which opens up this lovely, uh, sort of running metaphor and, you know, play on words that we can talk about the deity God as well as the, the dog that lives in the cemetery. Yeah, because God the dog seems to me to be both a real dog and have very doggy qualities and to have been written by somebody who loves and understands dogs, but also to have qualities of a really vengeful Old Testament deity mm-hmm. Um, who sort of yes. bites down on her arm and and takes a while to warm up to the the female character in the novel. So h- how did you see um, God the dog? <laughs> um, very much so. It was difficult for me to to write some of that because, I, as you say, I love dogs to pieces. I I can't walk past one without you know crouching down to scratch the ears. But um, I also have an interesting sort of passed with faith, let's call it faith in general, um, where I've, I've believed, I've tried to stop believing, I couldn't quite stop believing, um, but couldn't quite believe. And, you know, I think a lot of us have that same journey. And um, it was a lovely way for me to talk about my struggles with faith, um, being sort of imagine me crouching down and trying to befriend this dog um, that sometimes bites me and I don't understand why. Um, and, and ends I think up the eating novel your plays face. it out. I don't want to give too much away. 
<laughs> yeah, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, a marvelous, I, marvelous <laughs> metaphor for religion. <laughs> there, there we go. Um, but uh, yeah, so extremely dangerous and um, graphic, but also um, could be the thing that just saves you, whether or not whether you believe in it or not. You know, um, whether it's real or not, that it could still be the thing that saves you. So it's, it's a lovely. Um, I stumbled upon that when I was writing. I didn't plan it out when I first wrote the character of dog. Um, I, you know, there's only, it only happens sometimes where you sort of, it's on your writing day and you sit back in your chair and you're like, Oh, wow, I'm onto something here. You know, um, today is a good writing day. I came up with something. And once that's in, like I said, I don't plan. I'm not very good at it, but what I am good at is connecting the dots quickly. Once I've made a change or, or come up with an idea and that idea sort of grew and grew and grew from the start of the novel. So let's talk it. about that not planning. To what extent, um, so obviously you are, if we ask you, are you a plotter or are you a pantser? You're a pantser, but you must sit down with some idea. To what, 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 how big is your idea when you sit down to start a new book? Um, it's smaller than you think. Uh, I, I've tried to, yeah, I've, I've tried to plan. Um, I've done it before in the past where I've, where I've laid out plot points and, and I would sit down on a day and know I need to write this scene so that we can get from here to here. And when I've ever, I've done that every single time, the writings match, the magic's disappeared. Um, and, and it, it's fine, but it's not good. And what I've learned is that there's a, that I need to be completely open. You know, every writer has a strength, some, some of fantastic characterization, some plot points, all those different things. But for me, I think the joy is in the ideas. Um, those little asides that you were talking about and, um, and being open to take it anywhere it could go. Like I said, God came up and I just followed it. I, and, uh, and I think that, that sort of keeping it loose like that, um, allows me to, is the factor that makes me different perhaps from other things that are out there at the moment. Um, well, it, it, or at least just gives me joy, you know, even if it's not that. So I do have a vague idea. I have a, um, I have a starting point always, which will always be as probably a, a scene. I'll probably have a starting scene, which is in the beginning of this one is an old man walking down the street with his dog. Um, I know that's going to happen when I sit down. Um, and I vaguely know little pieces along the way, but, and then the ending I have, the ending probably changes 10, 15 times while I'm writing. I, I, I kind of have an idea, Hey, this is going to be divided into a couple parts and I need to sort of get there. But I, that's about it. I don't write, you know, sitting next to, I think it was Jared Thompson and, um, and my first interview on the book scene. And they were telling me about the pages of character notes and graphs and, you know, so much so it was, it was someone else, um, that was telling me that, what did they do? Yeah, they used to write down even things from like eye color to, you know, the shape of the eyebrows on a page. And I've, I've got none of that. I've got like a little a notebook that makes me look like a serial killer. If you ever find it, it's just scribbles everywhere and notes going back and forward. Um, but that seems to work for me. I wanted to ask whether you suffered anything of what they call sophomore syndrome in writing your second book, the second one that's going to appear this year, because uh, creative yeah. artists who have a debut that makes a big splash and is very highly regarded as Buried Treasure was, I would say it was one of the biggest books of last year, um, those artists often find it hard to get going on their second work um, there's a kind of self-consciousness, a self-doubt about whether lightning will strike twice, whether this is going to be as good, whether it needs to be more of the same sort of thing or whether you have the freedom to do something different. Yeah. Now, I, I suspect that the fact that, you know, you, you already had these manuscripts written out um, before Berry Treasure came out maybe helped smooth the way. But did you experience anything of what I'm talking about? Does any of that resonate? I know I come across as relatively calm, I, but I keep my storms inside, you know, and I, um, I went through a lot of, uh, sort of ins inside turmoil once Buried Treasure came out. You know, it came out and it's a dream come true and something I'd been trying to do for 15 years and it finally comes out and I found myself 
um, sort of looking around and thinking, is any of this real? Like, um, is it as good as, you know, as people are telling me it is, is, um, did I fluke it? Uh, you know, all, all these things, I, I can't help but go through it. I, I wish I could, um, gloss over it, but I can't. My way of going through it is to actually write all those feelings into something else. So that's my way of processing. And I think that it saved me from the sophomore slump a little bit. I just start writing a character that's full of self doubt and wondering what to do next. And, uh, you know, I see myself very much as one of my characters from my books. Uh, you know, we're all just trying our best with what we've got. And this becomes my story now that, you know, it wasn't before that it was the story of a guy that's trying really hard, but failing, um, commercially failing. But I had decided to look at it as a guy that's trying really hard and not giving up. And now it's a character about a guy who's finally got through, but he's not sure if he can do it again. And um, I think when you look at it as a character with a bit of distance from yourself, you've got incredible sympathy for the character. You're like, oh, shame. Like, <laughs> that's, a, that's a tough thing to go through. And, and you, yeah, and you, yeah, I, I'm prone to that. But um, you, you start rooting for them and backing them to do well. And I, and I think that helps me a lot with a bit of distance. But what you're saying is true as well. I had already written God's Pocket um, before before Buried Treasure came out. I had finished the manuscript. So if it is <laughs> uh, a dip in quality, it's not because of the sophomore, the sophomore slump. Um, and I did, I did have the self-doubts about wondering whether or not I should, you know, I had two manuscripts to deliver that I felt were ready um, to Penguin. And they and I mean, wonderfully, they bought them both. Uh, but the question was which one to come out next. And, and one of them, the one that is coming out next is another Vivo book. Yay. So I did have that question. Is, is it more of the same or is it something different? Because the, the, the next one, um, is one that's very dear to my heart. It's a, it's sort of a fictionalized version of my childhood and my relationship with my brother, um, who I'm very close to. And, it, so it was very difficult for me to decide which one to come out next. And, and I have right now sitting here, you know, my book comes out in May and I have a lot of, um, a lot of excitement because I love this one truly. Um, it's, it's kind of like buried treasure, but I think people will see it as very similar. But if you really compare the two side by side, they, they're quite different. Um, this one has a lot more sort of plot points in action, um, a lot of nostalgia. I, I love that coming of age period of our lives. Like I was talking about being at university and looking around and being different from other people. It's, it's that I've got a whole cast of characters at university now, um, figuring out what to do with their lives. Um, one of them wants to be a writer, but his parents are making him be an accountant. So I guess this one's also a fictionalized version of my childhood. Um, and again, there's something sinister in the air and a lot of philosophy and a, and a lot of musing about life. Um, but it feels different to me, this one, than Buried Treasure. So I'm, I probably, on my bad days, on my good days, I'm excited. On my bad days, I'm anxious. Um, but most of the time, I'm just curious. I can't control what people think of it. So I love it. I love Buried Treasure as well. So I can only, I can only hope really that other people love it too. Um, and if they don't, then that's okay. Uh, I'm starting to figure out this whole good review, bad review thing. I actually loved what you wrote the other day about it being a Marmite book. Um, because it does seem like that. Like it, for some people, you can't write something different and expect everybody to like it. You know, and I think impossible. you can't write about death and God and expect everyone to see the humor. <laughs> Um, you know, I think I wrote in that review, Sven's referring to a review I wrote on a Facebook page, um, that if you take death very seriously or God very seriously, you're probably going to get a little bit upset by the book. But if you can laugh a little bit yeah. at both those things, then like me, you're going to find it very, very funny. Yeah. Sven, it's quite hard to, to pin down what genre buried treasure is, but if one were going to, and then one would call it literary fiction, um, I think – which, which is a genre I'm normally quite scared of. I think you might have brought me back to it. But did you set out to yeah, be yeah. a literary writer? Did you think, I'm going to write a literary sort of book and not a genre type of book? No, um, I love genre fiction as well. I, I, you know, I think the problem is a lot of literary writers, um, there seems to be like a, 
a snobbiness to it or a stiffness. Um, and they, you know, genre fiction is seen as, oh no, the guys are just making things for TV, you know, but I don't think so at all. I think genre fiction is wonderful. And if, if I had, if that was the way my brain worked, I would write it. Um, I particularly, I really like the horror genre, to be honest. It's a fantastically interesting genre. Um, but for me, this is literally, this is just the way my brain works. Uh, I didn't, I'm not trying to, um, come across as clever. I, I'm completely unstudied in all of this stuff. Like my training is in accounting. I've, I haven't done anything in English since high school. Um, my only education is reading a lot, you know, so I think what you're seeing is, is a product of what I read, um, versus in conjunction with how my, my mind works. Uh, it's not an, it's not an intentional aiming at anything. Yeah, I've seen you described by critics as an entirely self-taught writer because you didn't go that traditional route of studying literature, of working in tangential fields like journalism or advertising or TV writing or anything like that. But I've, I've also read that you read an enormous amount. Um, I think the, the figure thrown around was about 65 books a year and um, that your uh, reading matter of choice includes the um, South American magical realists and there probably is no better training ground than to read those books. Um, so is is that where you've got your inspiration? Is that h- how you learn to write, through reading the masters of the craft? I think so. You know, I, I, I listened to your podcast uh, when you interviewed Craig Higginson, and I'm, I'm busy reading a Craig Higginson book at the moment, and... Um, when I listen to someone like I listened to him talk at the Midlands Festival as well. And when I, I remember sitting there thinking, wow, like I hope they don't, I hope he never asked me a question. You know, he just sounds so thought out and, um, so, so just well versed in his craft. Um, and, and here I am just sort of winging it, um, with my, you know, using my intuition mostly. Um, but I do, I do think that just reading a lot. 65 books is, is what I was reading until I became published. And then I, I've read my own book probably 65 times in one year, just trying to edit the things, you know? Um, so the numbers come down a little bit, but I do think that reading is enough. I think that if you read, especially those South, well, it's not, like I said, I read widely. I'll read John and fiction. I'll read everything, but every once in a while, I'll pick up a book and you'll feel that magic, um, from it. And you'll think, I oh, know there's something here. And every time I pick up sort of that magical realism side of things, um, I almost always feel it. And I don't necessarily want to recreate it, but I want to use that feeling into something. You know, I th- sometimes I look at the greats, like as I, I was thinking of Jose Saramago, who won the Nobel um, Portuguese writer. And he he's so clever and his stories are so like twisty and interesting and, and his narrator, he's got a narrator that it's himself that goes off on an aside, but he's also so annoying. <laughs> um, it's like, it's an older way of thinking that uh, I loved what he was doing, but I found myself getting frustrated at the time. And I was, so I sit back and I think, can I do the same thing, but can I do it in a more modern way that's accessible? Um, which is what you were saying, um, Gail, but hopefully f- making literary fiction accessible and not making it stuffy and stuff. Mm. And, and I think that's where it, so, so those kind of ideas come to you while you're reading these great writers. And then, then besides reading, I suppose the only other way to learn is just by making a lot of mistakes, um, which is those, all those early novels for me are complete mistakes. Um, and eventually finding your voice and, find, and finding a way. I don't think there's any, I don't think anyone can teach you how to be yourself. I suppose that's the way of saying it, you know. You've said so much that I'm relating to you. I'm like writing little notes um, for myself. Um, I think I think one of the things is I've always said when I tell people about writing that there are only two rules about how to be a writer and only one of them is really a rule, which is that you have to sit down and write. And then the secondary rule is that yeah. you should read. Um, it's a little bit yeah. hard to be a writer if you don't read at all. Um, and I think that thing, I think, you know, Agreed. I think a lot of people come to writing and think I can't be a writer because I haven't studied English and I haven't studied literature. I'm like you, Sven. I have a proper day mm. job um, that is not writing and is a little bit boring sometimes. And I'm taught through reading 
and hopefully my writing's not too awful. I've discovered this week that I don't know what a transitive verb, it, verb is um, because I'm helping my son with his English. My, my English education is shocking. I don't know what my school was up to. Um, but I think one can be a writer despite that. <laughs> I do think so too. Yeah, I mean, knowing knowing the name for transitive verbs is not going to help you write a good sentence. You know, it's um, yeah, it's going to be something else. It's going to be flair. And, <laughs> it yeah. happens or it doesn't happen. You don't really have to understand that it's happening. <laughs> yeah, I, I think of all that gra- those grammar terminology as quantum physics. You know, it's, we all no one really understands it, but it's it's there and it's doing its thing. You know? Um, you mentioned the role of the narrator and um, your narrator in Buried Treasure is very interesting because he's quite intrusive at times. He will pop up and say, okay, enough of that. Let's turn our attention here or um, maybe we've stayed too long here and we need to look over there. And he'll kind of break the fourth wall, address the reader and redirect the story sort of um, uh, in an interesting and um, quite deliberate way. At what stage of writing the book did you find that narrator's voice or was it there from the beginning? It was there from the beginning, yeah. So what I wanted to do, every other book I'd written before this was in the first person. Um, it's It worked well for my sense of humor. It worked well for me to be able to comment on what was happening. Um, and remember that early book that Penguin liked, I had written a different viewpoint and they wanted it all in the first person. So the first person was working for me. Um, but in this, when it came to Vivo, I wanted to be able to talk about life from more of a zoomed out viewpoint, you know, make it a more overarching thing, which a single character wouldn't have enough perspective um, to be able to comment on. Um, so I started writing in the third person and it wasn't quite working as it usually doesn't. And so I cheated, basically, which is, I think someone told me I, I was breaking rules, but I didn't realize there are rules. So I was just carrying on. But I realized that my third person voice could be first person, basically. Um, it's an amalgamation of the two. And so my narrator has a character and gets involved. Um, you can, you can almost imagine him as being one of the characters and he's sort of, scuttling around, commenting, you know, looking through a window to see what happens and, and then commenting on it and hurrying back somewhere else, almost like it's his day job, you know. I'm afraid he's a little bit um, like that chap who stands in the bushes watching the phone booth. <laughs> <laughs> but he apologizes for it, so it's fine. Because you know? you know? um, don't you sometimes have that when you're, when you're reading or writing, especially when I'm writing, I'll be very conscious of the fact that I'm messing my reader around a little bit, you know, um, I'm withholding information that they're going to find out later. And um, and it was lovely to be able to have a mechanism to apologize for that. <laughs> you know, near the end of the book, you know, the narrator might say, listen, guys, I'm sorry, I've been dying to tell you this the whole time. But, it, you know, this is my job and I take my job seriously. I'll be sitting on my desk right where I am now thinking, I don't know what to do next. And then I'll write that. I'll open the chapter and write, hey, this is a tough job. I don't know what to tell you about next. Maybe this thing, maybe that thing. Um and it suddenly gets the wheels moving again and I'm back in, you know. Um, so it's a very honest interjection from from me, you know. Yeah, I personally love to head hop, which is one of the cardinal sins of writing, supposedly, to sort of jump from one person's yeah. point of view to another. So I found a good workaround for that, which is to have different chapters in the, the name and the voice of a different character. So I can head hop yes. with impunity and it, it works well for me. But I, I also feel like I'm cheating there. Like I found a, a workaround <laughs> to do the thing I want while still say, sort of staying within the acceptable rules of literature. Yeah. Aren't we allowed to head hop? I head yeah, hop a lot. Right. I thought that that was perfectly acceptable. <laughs> oh, no. I always get my hands slapped for head hopping. Really? Yes. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> So we, we, we're running out of time and there's something I've got to talk to you about, which is that you seem to have mm. quite a talent for marketing your book. Um, so first of all, I'm going to tell you that on one of my writer WhatsApp groups, I will not, I will not embarrass my friends by telling you who's on the group, but we have had a long debate about whether we too should take off our shirts and cuddle our dogs, um, in our Instagram <laughs> posts, whether that will work for us or whether that ship oh, has no. sailed. Um, you, you seem like, to be doing something quite different. You draw, you, you do, you, 
you do these topless reading videos. Um, it's some. Uh, I, I want to know what led you to this this angle of marketing and if it's working. Um, uh, this, this, first of all, that's hilarious. Um, I, w- I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't. Uh, Classify my marketing as topless marketing. You know, it's no, not, it's uh, it's not every post guy. <laughs> okay. Um, I just live in Durban and it's really hot here, you know, that's how, uh, that's my excuse. Um, sure, sure. I think it's, yeah. So, so it was in the beginning of last year. Um, I was sitting with my sister in, um, a cafe in Belito and, I didn't have, I only had my own personal Instagram page. I didn't have a book page and we pulled out a notebook and we were like, we need to make a a page for this thing. And it was so overwhelming. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how to, you know, I'm a very self-conscious person. I didn't know how to come across um, if it would be accepted. And then I'd feel like it was me personally that's not accepted. And um, I overthink everything. And I sat there with her and I've got, a, I've got that notebook somewhere. It's got a couple bullet points and I think I didn't do much of what was written on that page. I think I just started treating it like my normal Instagram page. Mm. Um, I don't think of it as marketing. Uh, I think of it as another part of the writing process. I, I'm not trying to like, obviously I'd love it to look cool and, and come across well. And that's, everyone wants that. But I think I'm trying to do something that is honest to mm. me. Mm. Like if you come into my life, that photo that you'll see of me sitting outside with my dog is exactly where I sit and read every time the sun comes out and I'm working from home. And, um, and I try and I, I've got, you know, the videos with the music and that kind of thing is, it's something that is very dear to me or my musical past. Mm -hmm. It's the way I see the world, you know, when I'm driving and I've got the song on and my dogs are on my shoulders. And, um, I know it's the good parts of my life. You're not going to see me looking upset and fighting with my wife and that, but, um, it is very honest. And I think, I hope that, that resonates with people when they, when they watch it. And, uh, that's again, I can't, I, I think it's working. I'm, I, you know, it feels nice. Like that's all yeah. I can tell you is it feels good when yeah. I, when I do it. Yeah. Maybe I'll, um, maybe I'll feel warmer about social media if I let my dog get more involved. Um, yeah, I think you need to yeah. move to a warm climate and take off your top, Gail. No, I'm, I'm not taking off my top. <laughs> that ship has sailed, but the dog can get involved. <laughs> <laughs> oh, funny. And I, I think it's so funny that it's that's what's come across as a, my top list. It's, I have a friend, actually, who's really jacked. He's like puts a lot of effort into working out, and he's a writer too, um, unpublished. And we were saying that that's his ticket. You know, he's got a he's going to have start a page that's just his him reading, but just abs everywhere, you know? Um, so we'll see if it works for him as a purely test case summary and then go from there. Okay, so we're going to, we're going to ask the listener to give us feedback. Go and have a look at Sven's social media and tell us if you think that this approach is working for him and tell us how much you think is topless reading and how much you think isn't. Um, I'm interested in and whether the rest, you would like the rest of the writing world to follow Sven's um, excellent um, example. <laughs> Lots of feedback we can get there. I just wanted to ask yeah. about you using Bob Dylan's lyrics from A Hard Rain's Are Gonna Fall. I saw that you described them as scaffolding on which you were hanging the narration of the book. Um, why why yeah. those lyrics and and how did they provide a, a useful framework for you? Bob Dylan is sort of a big part of my musical childhood i think i always wanted to like bob dylan but i but i never could quite make myself like it um uh, i remember i bought when cds were still a thing i bought a a copy of blonde on blonde and every time i listened to it i thought it was awful um and then one day many years later when now we're into phones and ipods and things i was i i had a scooter and i was driving on the streets of durban and i used to put headphones under the helmet and i put on that album and I finally understood it. It's it, like it, it was a long process to finally understanding Bob Dylan. And I say understanding Bob Dylan as if that's possible. Um, but, but at least feeling Bob Dylan, you know, and feeling what, what was coming at me. And, um, I thought it was a lovely, uh, sort of link to writing where it took me ages to, to feel that, you know, something really positive about the writing. Like I finally found a groove and, and, um, 
so the Bob Dylan lyrics just fit in perfectly. I, I think I think I was listening to that song, and it was just the one line. Um, there was a I, I saw a white man walking a black dog, and uh, even as I said, I feel sort of shivers and a, a bit of emotion from it because it was such a connection to me. And I wrote that on the page, and then I started writing, and from there. I would, every time I finished what I felt was like a part, you know, one of the parts that you see, I would look at the next part and I would, and I would look through the song and there was always something that I needed and I never knew what it would be. I didn't, I hadn't mapped it out. You know, part of the magic and mystery of Bob Dylan is that you don't understand why it's working. And, um, and that was part of the writing process too. So I'd get to part two and I'd look and it was obvious that this was the line that was supposed to be there and it would help me, um, frame the next section that I'd have to write um, and I just listened to that song a lot on repeat while I was um, while I was writing that as well. leads into our final question that we like to ask our interviewees which is what have you been reading or listening to or watching lately that has made any kind of an impression on you um, wow that's a, that's a big question for me that's like a, we should all get a glass of wine and, and talk for the whole <laughs> evening um <laughs> I absorb stuff from everywhere. I, I love, I don't mind if it's TV shows, music, music is a big one. Um, other books, chatting to people. I love talking to other people that, um, they'll just throw out some random comments or sense of humor that they have. And I find it so inspiring. Um, but at the moment, sure. Okay. TV shows. I've recently watched The Bear. I don't know if you've seen The Bear, oh, uh, about a chef. It's amazing. It's absolutely amazing. It's got old nineties music in, in, in it as well, which is interesting. Um, brilliantly acted. It's, it's chaos. It's, if you, I don't know if you ever worked in a kitchen. Um, I was a terrible waiter for a couple of years and a barman. And when I look at what's going on in that show, it's that like unbridled chaos for three hours during rush time. And then, you know, it's, it's really well acted. Um, what else? Music was. I've changed the way I listen to music a lot recently. I, for each book I write, I've mentioned this in things, but I, I'll make a playlist before I start writing. It's a big part of the process. So I don't plan, but I make playlists. Um, and I'll sort of make a 2025 20, song playlist and I'll listen to it almost every single time I sit down to write um, a novel. And so it's hard to say what I'm listening to because I'm listening to specific playlists that I've made of lots of different um, artists and it generally is a feeling I'm, I'm looking for a mood um, and it might be surprising some of the songs don't seem to, to like belong in the same playlist together but the mood is the same for me and I think when I sit down to write I instantly get put into the into the right feeling that I'm supposed to be in to write the novel um, saying that obviously with Barry Treasure which was I wrote a couple of years ago I was listening to a lot of Bob Dylan and um but also there's a, the back then there was a band called Frightened Rabbit, um, which I almost don't particularly recommend. I'd almost want to like give you specific songs to get into, but, um, classic me, everything's complicated, but, uh, his story was more interesting to me. He, he was a guy that battled with depression and his songs are so raw about that struggle, but he, they almost seem kind of like Viva. They almost, it's that perfect tone where they seem, he seems to be failing, but there's a there's an element of not giving up that is triumphant in them as well, um, which is such a beautiful thing to me. And around about the time that I was writing this, he killed himself and sort of lost his battle with depression. And um, it's the one of the most moving uh, musical deaths that I've ever experienced. You know, I was I was a teenager listening to Nirvana when Kurt died, and this affected me more. You know, it was something that this guy's lyrics are just really close to my heart. Um, and so I listen to a lot of that as well. And again, I don't see it as a miserable thing. I see it as, a, I, even though he lost his fight, um, I think he's encouraged a lot of people to keep fighting when, when they're down and out as well. You know? So I was listening to a lot of that at the time too. And anything you've been I'm trying reading? to think, oh, reading. Um, I've been re catching up on a lot of South African fiction. Uh, I embarrassingly th used to think that I was the only person in Durban writing books. Um, which now I realize was horrifically wrong. Uh, I am busy. I've just finished reading Shubnam Khan's, um, The Lost Love of Akbar We've been watching Manzo, you read it. And I'm, <laughs> yes, with my shirt off, yeah. Um, 
And that that one I, I've thoroughly enjoyed. I'm going to be chatting to her in a couple of weeks' time. Um, I'm busy reading Craig Higginson's book now, um, the Book of Gifts. I'm reading at the moment. Um, both of them have been lovely in different ways. I'm listening to that one that was shortlisted for the Man Booker Prize um, called The Bee Sting. Uh, I think it's Paul Murray. Oh, right, yes. And and I'm listening to it on audio, which has been lovely because it's read with an Irish narrator. Um, so you get the beautiful Irish accent. Um, that's been really cool. And then before that, well, I mean, it, it's anything. It's It was those those late release McCarthy novels just before he died. Um uh, Alejandra Zambra's Chilean poet. I loved that book. It was beautiful. Um, also just full. Of, I don't really understand poetry and it was a book about poets and it was such a lovely way to understand poetry a little bit better because the poets themselves didn't seem to understand what they were doing. And it was just this lovely, um, crazy world of poetry, you know? Um, so yeah, that's, that's probably it at the well, moment. Well, Sven, we hope that everyone, those few remaining people who haven't read Buried Treasure yet will rush out and buy it. It's still in print everywhere. And we think that everyone is looking forward to God's pocket as much as we are. You said it's coming out in May from Penguin Random House. Yes. So thank you very much. Yeah, I, um, coming out in May. And I'm super excited about it. And you guys have both got books coming out, you told me. So hopefully we'll be on the book scene together. And um, hopefully you'll be doing a launch in Johannesburg. It. Yes. I would, you know what? I, I never got to – I was in Kingsmead at the festival mm. uh, this last year. But I – oh, cool. Um, but I never got to go to Love Books. Um, and I really wanted to go there. Um so I would love to do a launch there. That would be so much fun. Okay, Dragon, are you listening? So to much this? fun. <laughs> Gail, were you expecting Sven to be such a fun interview? I think you saw the the humour in Buried Treasure, so maybe you weren't surprised at how much fun he was to talk to. I was expecting it because really, I think that for me, Buried Treasure was was, and I think we both we we had a very different experience of Buried Treasure. And for mm-hmm. me, while I see the darkness. For me, it was primarily a very funny book. There, there are lines in that book, and I'm not a big one to stop and reread a line, mm-hmm. but there were lines in that book that I laughed out loud, and then I stopped and I reread it. It was often the, the jokes around the dog called God mm-hmm. um, and the funny little observations. Like there's a sentence that I think says, God, as it tur- who, as it turned out, was a woman. Yes. Um, so I, I was expecting a lightness from Sven that... We got. And whereas I was, I sort of leaned more into the darkness in that book. <laughs> but Sven was absolutely delightful and we're so grateful that he gave us his time. What did you take from that discussion? So as a writer, the big thing I have in common with Sven is the day job aspect, uh, having mm-hmm. quite a serious day job and that, that doesn't always fulfill one's creative needs. And what he said, he talked about being disciplined and organized in order mm-hmm. to get his writing done. And he talked about writing first thing and then being able to come to his day feeling like he'd been in that slightly different world and done something different. And I think that's something I need to go back to. Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm quite inspired by that. I think that I will be trying to do that more right right and you Fiona I was very struck by what he said about learning from reading Mm. that he he doesn't shy away from big or difficult Mm. or challenging books that he really fills up his reading Mm. life with those books and that he's learned so much from them because one cannot deny that this is an incredibly accomplished mm. debut. Mm. It feels as though it was written by a much more experienced writer. And he got all that from books, from reading. Yeah. So that is what is inspiring me. I am still trying to, you know, read at least a fifth of a book every day. And perhaps I'll allow myself to choose more challenging books at the moment and not just sort of flit around in the fluffy stuff and maybe when you choose a really big challenging book you mustn't try and read a fifth of it in a day (laughs) I think that I think that's where the target reading can become problematic you know there's a difference between reading a fifth of buried treasure which is while quite a literary book it's quite short Mm -hmm. and then covenant of water which is the book that I'm currently frightened to read (laughs) um so yeah I, I think I think one's got to be careful with those targets a bit 
And in terms of writing advice, what have you got for us this week? Well, I think I've actually said it already when we were speaking to Sven, that Mm -hmm. to remind people that there is only one way a book gets written. There is only one rule about writing, Mm -hmm. and that is to write. Or Everything else you taught about writing is optional. But you have to write to write. There's no other way it's going to happen. And rule number two, the sub-rule, is read. It's always very confusing when you meet someone who tells you that they're going to write a book, but they don't read much. Yes, indeed. And there's no way of knowing whether this idea that you think is is brilliant and absolutely unique Mm. has been done before until you actually have read quite widely across various genres, including literary, and you become familiar with what has been said, and then you can use that to build your own ideas on. I don't really think there's any other way of doing it. So we want everyone to check out Buried Treasure. Gail and I both loved it. It's available as an ebook and as a physical book in all bookstores. And we're very much looking forward to God's Pocket, which is coming out in May. And if any of you have read Sven and have thoughts about his books or his Instagram yes, posts, his Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> then by all means, get in touch. We are present on all social media. You've been listening to another production from Solid Gold Podcasts.